Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and thank you very much for having us. It's really, really wonderful to be here with you all tonight. And I'm especially pleased to be here to introduce Rena Banerjee, who I had the pleasure of working with over the last four years on her retrospective and book, um, which is floating around somewhere. Um, and um, as she mentioned, it will be traveling. It starts, it's open right now at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia, so if you find yourself on the East Coast, come by. Um, then it will be in San Jose, California at the San Jose Museum of Art, then the Fowler Museum at UCLA, then the Frist in Nashville, and finally at the Nasher and Duke. So we'll be busy for the next few years with this project. Um, some of you may know that the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts is the United States' first art museum and school. It was founded in 1805, and since then it has been devoted to art made in the United States. So it was very important to me when I arrived at PAPA as Curator of Contemporary Art for about four, almost five years ago now, um, that we put Rena Banerjee's work in this context. She's been shown all over the world, from the Venice Biennale uh, to solo exhibitions at the Musée du May, um, and soon to be at the Kochi Biennale um, in India. Yet, uh, despite living in the US for many, many years and receiving her MFA from Yale, um, she's, she's less known in the United States, I would say, than she is in, in Europe or, or in Asia. So the other point for me is that she's, she's certainly considered within the history of di a dias diaspora art, but rarely in the context of American art. So I, we really wanted to place her work there. Um, and I, I should flip to an image, because it's way more exciting to, to look at. I brought some installation shots. Um, her work is at the in intersection of so many critical issues, um, so many of today's most critical issues. The idea that identity is a constantly shifting negotiation between the self and cultural forces, uh, the relationship, certainly, between globalism and colonialism. She approaches gender from a global, global, global perspective as well, um, shedding Western definitions of feminism, for example. Um, and perhaps most importantly, she thinks about the social and economic inequalities inherent to the global movement of people and goods, and as well, that the effect of that on, on our natural environment. So we took the opportunity to show how these ideas have been present in art in the United States since the beginning by installing Rina's work um, in our 19th century building and among our treasures of American art. Um, in fact, a, a review recently came out, I don't know if you've heard this yet, but um, it said that the effect is a sense that Papa has set a contagion loose in the timeline of American art, which really made me quite happy. Um, we gave great thought to how Rina's work could enliven and disrupt these um, narratives of American art. For example, um, in our um, gallery that's hung salon style doors, which is a very traditional 19th century style painting, paintings, we placed her incredibly beautiful pink plastic Taj Mahal called Take Me, Take Me, Take Me to the Palace of Love. Um, we disrupted those, the, the hierarchies of, hang, of hanging, I hope. You'll notice that the piece is floating. But also, it draws attention to uh, Orientalism in, those early, um, in, in early American art, and thinking about how that's present in those early paintings. Um, for her beautiful piece, A World Lost, uh, we selected works from Papa's collection um, in, in, that, that deal with sublime landscapes, so thinking of Rina's contemporary installations as, as landscapes, even. Um, we have a new Frederick Church that's in the back that has been getting wonderful comparisons to the piece, um, as well as paintings that show 19th century consumer desires. Whether that be still lifes um, or um, you know images of, of local port cities that early American artists were painting, like like Venice, for example. And here, this is one of my favorites. Actually, we hung a piece by Rina called, well, the abbreviated title is called "The Promise of Self Rule," and you'll see that it's hanging between two portraits of George Washington. So, disrupting that idea of, of what is self rule. Um, one of the one of the problems we really want to in to introduce is the fact that these founding fathers thought that they were coming um, for their own self-rule, while at the same time taking away <coughs> that rule from the people that had been living on that land for forever. Um, the other one that I want to end, up, end on is we, um, one of Papa's iconic paintings is, is Penn's Treaty with the Indians, which you'll see over on, the, on your right. Um, and it show, it's Benjamin West's painting of, of uh, William Penn trading with the Lenape people for Philadelphia. Um, 
you can certainly start to see the, the material and formal crossover with the feathers that Rena's using in her piece for captivity. But more importantly, we wanted to call attention, uh, we wanted to call attention to the fact that these historical paintings, these things that we consider to be, some people consider to be the truth, are very romanticized versions of what happened in these moments of, 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 of invasion, really, in the United States. Um, so at a time, I, I hope that you all see as Rena, Rena speaks, that at a moment when we find that there's um, rising nationalism and a resistance to globalism, in fact, that, that the work that, Rena, that her work and the things that she's discussing are ever more pressing and vital. Um, and we, we've seen that in just a few weeks that the, that the exhibition's been open, open and happening. So please join me in welcoming Rena, who will talk more in depth about her work.
um, from that exhibition. And it was kind of a, a biennial in the way the US understood now biennials. Now, if you recall, um, in the US, biennials were sponsored by museums. So a museum would display what is essentially a large group show, and they would be called a biennial. So that has changed in art history in the US. And perhaps learning from the world, realizing biennials are not only about the visual arts, but the performance arts. It's also about the history of a place and the history that you bring to a place that you want to talk about. So that kind of responsibility I kind of learned um, through the journey of 10, 12 years, how to um, learn from a particular history and bring it into the work without being didactic, without telling the story of history, but telling a personal story. So Viola is a specific individual who lived in the 1800s in New Orleans, and she's an African-American woman. And the reference to her history is a reference to a migration from Bangladesh of silk traders who came in steamships, and they were called Black Bengalis. And the Black Bengalis came to Harlem at first and then drew through a series of um, kind of, um, I would say networking, um, that we would call it networking now, um, drew to the people or citizens in different uh, cities that were part of the migration. So during this time, there was the sudden migration of freed slaves, as well as the migration of uh, South Asian Bengalis leaving India because they could not practice their trade of um, and commerce of the silkens because the British had actually enacted certain laws that didn't allow them to sell these things. So in effect, these two mergers created these um, families that were Bengali and African. And the African American women were often called Asian according to the consensus in Louisiana. So I found that very interesting that the consensus forms didn't have one specific identity for this mixture to happen, but a litany of um, words were used in conjunction to mix marriages. So the work I felt really required me to think about how does government and organization of culture happen through migration? What are the elements that are being um, transformed in terms of their identity? And how does that take place in the trades that they take on, specifically the silk trade in New Orleans? So, oops. Um, so you have what is uh, what I call a rescue worker. Uh, Viola is her name, and so the title um, impresses upon you. And Viola is a rescue worker, but she's also tilling the land of culture. And so she has these rakes before her that you see on the sides. And then there's this parachute that you see way be behind her in the air. And so it references this kind of initial landing. And the landing and the shore and the water and the seashells, there's oysters. Um, oyster shells, I should say, not oysters. Um, and there's also these horns that are laid upon. There's seeds of different kinds, trading seeds, beads that maybe you know the Native Americans would have used to trade upon. Um, there's jewelry. There are these wings that are also very decorated and jeweled with the kind of sewing and beading um, that you would find in wedding. Um, uh, wedding dresses, there are Korean uh, wedding dresses that are used for fabric. Um, there's um, a Aruba mask that is worn. There's also a glass head. A lot of things that you don't necessarily um, realize until you're actually with the piece. This is called uh, Captivity and also has a very larger title. And this particular piece uses gourds as one of its uh, elements, there's a Victorian birdcage that alludes to home, the meaning of home, the meaning of captivity versus home. So this kind of polarization, what does it mean to feel at home and not feel captured, to be constrained by the boundaries of your shores, by your citizenship, by your passport. So all these questions have a relevance today, but they also reference a 
a larger history of negotiations that take place between personal history and the larger history of the country. This is the close-up, so you see the gourds, you see on the floor, that a lot of my sculptures have a floor element, I would say, or they float, uh, or they float and they have a floor <laughs> element. I often go to that because of this um, kind of reference, I think, philosophically, maybe conceptually, about a feeling, a sense of being lifted or rising, rising beyond what is roots us or um, keeps us in one place. And our inevitable mobility as a kind of freedom that we foresee having. So you see not only the shells, but these vines which uh, creep out, move forward. So most of the vines you see are grape vines. And they're used to really hold up these little uh, porcelain heads. The porcelain heads are painted and decorated. They are dressed. Um, and the uh, painting feathers that flutter out from the porcelain, from the uh, vines that you grow out of the bird cage, also kind of reflect on this kind of imminent <coughs> movement. This is called Boneflower. Boneflower was one of the uh, earlier works. I think it was like something like 2005, quite a while back. Um, I graduated from Yale in 1995, which gives you an idea how many years I've been working. When I came out of um, you know, my MFA program, because I studied with painting, it was really quite a challenge to learn how to make sculpture. So the first thing I did was to take an already existing object. And here you'll see two lanterns. And they're the kind of lanterns that you would find, and I literally found them in Queens um, on being thrown out. And there were these lanterns that were created to give you a sense of the Orient. Um, they had this ornamental decoration that was a filigree, we call it, in India. This glasswork that had this opulence of gemstones. And it was from the 1950s, which encountered this you know, kind of experience in the American culture, um, which was revisited in the 70s, again, with color and with the imagination of what is the modern. So the modern, during these times, visited the Orient as a place to relocate its understanding of its own culture. And so I was very invested in finding things that reference this vintage culture. And a lot of the objects you'll see I've used come out of that vintage history. Um, so these are laid on the floor. I think of them as his and her, and therefore the blue versus the red lights that you see. And the horn that you see is a um, ceramic horn that I made in Japan. And they reference this kind of nail as you would see or feel some crawling out of the waters or shore. And so you see on the floor the sand and kind of the darker sand around the actual objects reference sort of like a bleeding or um, what happens when the sand gets wet, gets darker. So all these things uh, kind of reference the body in many ways and in the objects themselves and the objects that are used on top of the objects, which are sometimes called the materials, are things like bone flour or uh, that brass wire that begins to look like here, if you can see the fuzziness around these lanterns. So and you see these spiky things that are also bone um, along the uh, horns, which I had a pointer to show you, but there are the white spots, so it's sort of like teeth. So a lot of my work has seashells or bones. Um, it also has uh, things that reference hair or things that I would say remain after we die, after the soft part of the body dies, the shell remains, so an oyster is absent, or in a cowrie shell, if the soft body is gone. So it's a reference to time, death, rebirth, but also these kinds of materials being brought back to Earth as a kind of recycling process that the whole environment would call Earth. 
is part of that we participate in. Promise of self-rule is, is, is talking about government and freedom. And I keep coming back to trying to understand what that means and whether freedom is possible and what does it feel like to feel free. And uh, I do that with a lot of the work in terms of thinking about constraints to freedom, a fear of the contaminant, fear of mobility, um, free, free of being in a specific home, having multiple homes. Is it possible for us to imagine feeling at home everywhere? Um, and I think a lot of that kind of contemplation came with my own movement and with the art community becoming international, where not only what did we have to keep a studio and galleries have to keep their gallery, but they have to show their gallery almost like a circus, it felt like. Uh, to bring the work to the world, and that kind of mobility allowed the kinds of conversations we're having in the art world um, to really take place as real experiences. Without the real experiences, we really couldn't talk about the world. It was very few who could. And so that kind of identity that is generated out of the movement of the art world away from a base, a home base, allows a kind of art to really develop from it. And so the promise of self-rule is also about gender, and it's about what it means for women to work away from the home, to, to expect the same kind of status in their freedom, um, to be able to speak um, in a way that is heard and not dismissed. Um, and so this chair is a reference to her seat. So the Victorians had these his and her chairs, which I use throughout my work. There's a few chairs, but the chair has a sense of power. It also has a sense of comfort and power together, which I associate with home and the domestic space. And the his and her chair, you can see the Victorian her chair is much more ornate, but also very delicate, um, very rounded, um, very organic in its shape, and less animal and more floral, more vegetable perhaps. And so I tried to use this floating chair rising up from a specific horn. If you look all the way in the bottom, beyond these kinds of fluttering um, feather fans, um, you see a horn that is about to touch the floor where there's a mound of white sand and there's three little figurines that are Chinese zodiac signs. And it's a kind of conjuring up what will be my future. Will I be uh, released? A kind of wish to take flight in this. Um, and then there's the neck that draws your attention between the bowl of fluttering feathers and the bowl that is her chair. And this kind of journey going back and forth from it there's little uh, fish bones, which are the spine of fish that run along the netting. So the netting kind of references this idea of captivity in the same way that the bird cage has its bird cage netting. So that netting comes across in a lot of my two-dimensional work as well. So these kinds of shapes, I'm continually echoing the roundness, the circulation and the realities of wanting a circulation that has no ending is a kind of freedom that is evoked in the work with the umbrella, with the fan-like structures that come off the seat of the chair, the roundness of the altar lights that you see on the rim of the chair, which are Chinese altar lights. So these, and let's see if I have the next one. This one <coughs> is a kind of also a movement that is um, presented in the work. This is called um, When Signs of Origin Fade, and it's a reference to the original continent that got shattered, Pangea, and the turtle story or the mythology around turtles. Um, we use a couple of different uh, animals that references world mythologies, and here you'll see the gourds again that kind of bubble out from the head 
or the crown of the mask that is in the center. And there's those echoing round shapes of these lampshades that if you could see that, they kind of uh, come out like flowers. And those are made of shells as well. There's a lot of thread that lingers on the shattered moments that you see mounted on the wall. And there's also these, um, it's harder to see in this, but these kind of um, glassware, scientific glassware that has a scent. So there's this uh, pleasure in not only the tactility out of the materials that are used, the references to organic shapes as well as animals, but the constellation and a scent that has to do with both the body and flowers, uh, bark, and that are played into the work that you can sense when you're close to the work. Um, they, the scents are mostly oils, they're essential oils that are dripped into the round bottom glass, essentially. Again, the umbrella is used, this is the title of the show as well as the title of the work made around 2013 um, for a solo show. And it also uses those great pines that kind of creep, move up and down the sculpture. There's a rhino that you see on top of a pedestal. There are horns that eject out of the pedestal and these kind of spiraling um, umbrellas. And on top of the rhino is a rider, and it's a, it's a doll's face that has been painted. Um, and there's this kind of slug-like body, which is the cow shells that you see. So her whole body has this kind of long horn-like shape as well. And it you know, kind of referenced this idea of journey and seeing the world and seeing everything that is in the world that is, becomes an object in your mind because you learn of it. This is what we reference as Little Red Riding Hood. I'm, I'm not sure what the exact title is. It's a long um, title as well. And here, this is a souvenir object that what I got as a tourist in India. And I brought it back and I made this kind of steel knitted um, draped cape. And I called her Little Red Riding Hood. Again, referencing the mythology of journey, um, danger, and being consumed. This is also a, a piece which has a souvenir, which is the bed itself, and references my grandfather's bed that I remembered um, during this time. And this was made in 2009, and there's a figure on the bed with a bed of all kinds of shells and also vials, both amber and yellow, that uh, trail from the bed as almost like a, a snake-like trail. And this is some of my drawings. This is a reference to the uh, dodo bird that uh, became extinct. So again, referencing that colonial uh, journey and the eagerness to consume the world where travel was so extreme, so necessary, so volatile and dangerous that as the sailors were stuck on this island, they ate every single bird there was. And unfortunately, the, um, this kind of bird could not fly away. Um, of course, I'm referencing the female body as well. Again, this is a piece that is uh, a wall mount. And I'm gonna go a little faster and go through all the images because we have quite a few. This is called Flourish, Migration's Breath. There's some more drawings in the rooms. This is a work from 1994. So this is what I, the work I did when I was a, a graduate student with hair that I had to reference. And 
You can see the constellation of bodies that I allude to without ground or landscape. And these two are two video works that are also part of the show from um, 2006. similar to making a summary of the world, I realize. So it has the sense of the figure and the animal. And we're almost there. <laughs> we have a lot of images.